I hope to see many of you making some quilts today. And if not, if you just want to little, learn a little bit about what it is, what it's all about, um, we're going to learn that today. So what is English paper piecing? English paper piecing is a technique whereby you use little hexagons um, to assemble a quilt. So what you do is you make these individual equally sized hexagons and you piece them together to create a geometric pattern. Now, English paper piecing is one of the oldest techniques for patchwork quilt making. It's believed to have originated in the 1600s or early 1700s. It's one of, again, the traditional English needlework techniques and the reason it's one of the oldest patchwork quilting techniques is because it does not require having any kind of measurement devices around. So to make traditional patchwork, you need to have a ruler of some kind. But with English paper piecing, all you need literally is paper of the right size. So you measure the paper once and then you're able to make a patchwork quilt out of just individual little scraps of fabric. It's also, it was also popular in the 1600s and 1700s, well into the 1900s because it's a thrifty way of reusing fabric. All you need is a tiny little scrap of fabric and you're able to make beautiful, pleasing shapes. Now, in order to get started with English paper piecing, you only need a couple of supplies. One is you need some heavy cardstock paper. I've got um, an old, reusable printable um, note card paper. You can also use any kind of um, cover paper that you can buy at your Staples or your Office Max. It's really cheap and so you're going to need some of that. You can also buy pre-cut templates but they are harder to come by than simply printing some off of the web. So if you search for printable hexagon templates you can find these and they're either free or very affordable and you just need to print some out yourself. Uh, you also need scraps of fabric, and I've got several pre-cut scraps here so that you can um, either mix and match different patterns or you can do a small limited number of patterns. Again, this was a scrap quilt making technique, which meant that people used up whatever they had in their homes. You also need, obviously, a pair of scissors to cut all of this out, thread, and a sewing needle. You don't need a sewing machine and any basic sewing needle will do. So you don't want to use a tapestry needle or any large thick sewing needle and be careful if you've never sewn before, do not purchase a sewing machine needle because you can't use those for hand sewing. Just a normal so-called sharp sewing needle is all you're going to need and they can be had for a dollar or two online. Now, if you're wondering what do I mean by a sharp sewing needle, aren't all sewing needles sharp? The answer is no, they are not. If somebody is sewing a very delicate fabric or like a jersey, like the, what you might make a t-shirt out of, those needles are actually blunt tipped and those will not be sharp enough for what you need to do. So just get a simple ordinary sewing needle. Again, don't use a tapestry needle, it's too thick and that also won't sew through all of the layers that you're going to be using today. So make sure you've got all of your equipment now I'm going to, for the purposes of this demo, just so that it's more visible, I'm going to be using black thread so that you can see my stitches clearly. If you're making your own quilt, what you're going to want to do is once you've mastered the technique, you're going to want to use fab, uh, um, a thread that closely matches the fabric that you're using. Now obviously since you're using a wide variety of fabrics, you see here this is cream colored, this is like a blue, um, this is a pink stripe. Obviously, you can't match all of these if you're sewing them together. So what I would use for something like this would be a beige thread. But you definitely don't, in a regular quilt making environment, want to use high contrast thread because it's not going to look very attractive, especially if you're new to sewing. When we're new to sewing, our stitches are often not the most even. 
so you're going to want to use something that blends in it's a delicate balance because of course as you start to learn to sew you need to see your stitches so what I would recommend is make a few practice pieces those probably should be with a dark color contrasting thread and then once you become more skilled then you can transition to using something that blends in okay so now you've got all of your equipment together we can get started now so the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to print out some templates um, for you to use and this obviously again printed on cardstock you don't want to use regular copier paper. You're going to use something a little heavier. It shouldn't be cardboard. That can be a little too thick, but a thicker um, card stock is typically what it's listed as um, in office stores online, or if you have some lying around the house, it would be either cover stock or card stock. Again, you can find these in many locations online. I will also try to post a link in the chat to one of my favorite sources for these printable hexi templates. I have to say they do cost about $10 for an unlimited subscription to print out as many as you want, but they are accurate. And so I use um, Tim Vandeval's um, copying the link and there ten dollars for a lifetime supply um, so yes the this degree of exactitude is very beginner friendly so what I'm going to do now I've got my templates is I'm going to cut out along the line and you want to cut exactly in the line of the template you want to make sure that you cut as evenly as possible and avoid having your hand sort of wobble but again as long as you're cutting along that line you should be totally okay so i'm going to cut all the way around the shape making sure to keep these corners nice and tight and sharp you don't want to blunt these corners now you're going to be able to reuse each template about two or three times maybe more if you're super careful with your templates but i am not i am hard on my templates so i end up only being able to reuse it maybe three or four times you're going to want to discard the template once these edges stop being sharp once they become dull you're going to discard charge your discard your template so now we're going to grab a piece of fabric so I am, for the sake of high contrast, I'm going to use one of my lightest color fabrics. And this is um, like a light colored pink and beige. Now in terms of what type of fabric to use, traditionally speaking, people would use silks, they would use velvets, they would use cottons. In fact, one of the first patchwork quilts made in America, the salt and stall quilt, was English paper pieced. It used a different shape. It used triangles in a pattern that eventually came to be known in honor of its New England roots here in the United States as the Yankee Puzzle. And that was made by the female members of the Salt and Stall family in the early 1700s. There's some debate about the date, but it may be as early as um, 17, I believe 1705. And what the Salt and Stall quilt was um, about, because again, some of these quilts are hard to date because they were made over the course of several years so it may have been started in 1705 and completed around prior to 1720. Um, it was collections of fabrics from the clothing of members of the family and this was a very common way of commemorating people in your family, loved ones, um, living and those who have, have died was to take scraps of their clothing and make them into a patchwork quilt. So traditionally, people would use all kinds of fabrics. Now, if you're a beginner, on the other hand, I strongly recommend that you use quilters' cottons. Quilters' cottons have been in the news lately because they are supposed to be among the best fabrics for use in making the masks that we are all wearing to keep each other safe. So they might be a little harder to get come by, but typically they're they're reasonably easy to come by and they can be affordable 
Um, a few tips if you've never purchased quilters cottons before is that I strongly recommend that you buy the best quality fabric that you can purchase, both for mask making, if you're making masks for your family, your friends and loved ones, but also for when we eventually get back to making our own quilts because the cheaper fabrics have a very loose weave. You know, if you've ever bought cheap pillowcases, they have a low thread count and they're not very nice. Now, it's not just the texture that's not very nice, it will tend to ravel when you try to sew with it, especially by hand. So if you're looking at fabrics, I tend to say the ballpark price would be about $10 to $15 a yard for a good quality cotton fabric. You can sometimes get it on sale, however, especially um, if you're not too picky about the colors if you, uh, that you're looking for. So this is Quilter's Cotton. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my template and I'm going to put it on the wrong side of the fabric. You can usually tell it's the wrong side of the fabric in that the print is much less bright. You can see this is the right side of the fabric. The print is very bright. And then this is the wrong side. It's considerably duller. So I'm going to take the hexi pattern and I'm going to place it on the dull, AKA wrong side of the fabric. Now, you don't have to be super precise, but again, if you're a beginning sewist, I would line the hexi up roughly with the edges of the fabric because this is going to be the less stretchy side of the fabric. All woven fabric has what's called a bias, and the bias is the side on which it is the most stretchy. And you do not want to try to sew on the bias when you're learning how to sew. You want to try to sew on the straight grain where there's, as you can see, considerably less stretch. So speaking of modern times, we will recall that after the last great pandemic, one of the many changes in society was that women stopped wearing such restrictive clothing. And one of the first things women would do in the 1920s when they shed the restrictive clothing of the World War I and um, influenza pandemic era and the Edwardian and Victorian times that came before it is that they started to wear bias cut clothing. Not only were clothes much lighter, fewer layers, shorter skirts, but it would be cut on the bias, which meant that it was stretchy and it had give and it had move and you could play sports and you could vote and you could go to college and do all those wonderful things our flapper foremothers did. But those clothes were also very tough to sew. So we're not going to be, we're going to be flappers today because of course we always aspire to be flappers, but we're going to cut our, our fabric on the straight grain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pin and I'm going to pin through the fabric and I'm going to pin through the cardboard template. You can see here they're nicely pinned securely together. You want to avoid the edges because you're going to be sewing through these edges so you don't want the pin to be there in your way. And if you're wondering whether you're going to stick your fingers, you are. Be prepared. Those of us who have been sewing and making for a long time, our fingers have developed some nice calluses. So um, if you want, you can get a flexible silicone thimble, which will protect your fingers from being stuck. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to cut around the shape, leaving a seam allowance. And again, typically I don't leave this generous a seam allowance, but in this case, I'm going to do that to make it easier and you will want to make a large seam allowance at first as you're learning to sew. So roughly eyeballing it, it should be about a quarter of an inch. You can go a little over. I'm going a little over right now. This does not have to be cut exactly because it's not going to impact the final shape. You again, don't want it to be too scant because that will be tough to sew. And you don't want it to be too much, too much further than a quarter inch because then it's going to make your piece bulky. So roughly you're going to cut a quarter inch around, but don't be too precise. Again, this is not going to be seen anywhere. You just want to make your life a little easier with the sewing. Speaking of which, we are now ready to get sewing. So I'm going to take my thread. And again, I would not recommend using black for your finished product if it's going to be on pink fabric, but I'm going to do it right now. And I'm going to just thread my needle Again, in normal times, we tend to want to lick the end of the thread. We definitely don't want to do that right now. And if you are in any way, shape, or form in need of reading glasses, 
this would be a great time to grab them because it is tough to thread a needle without your reading glasses if you depend on them. So let me grab my reading glasses here and then of course obviously look over the top of it as a reflex. You don't want to do that. And you're going to thread your needle and to thread your needle this is going to be really tough to see. What you just want to do is make sure that the needle goes, the th thread goes through the eye of the needle. This will take a couple of goes to go, begin with, but again, give it a good solid tug. Thread the thread through the needle um, and make sure that it is fully threaded. Some people will use a single um, thickness of thread. I like to use a double thickness of thread often because I make hexes into quilts and um, other things that need to be a little bit more durable. It also depends on the thickness of the thread. Again, I tend to like to use a pure cotton. This is a great brand out of Germany called Guterman. You can also, there's Aurifil out of Italy. Italy and Germany are the uh, great sources for some of the finest threads. And the reason you want to use a good quality thread, same as for good quality fabric, is durability and also ease of sewing. The more expensive threads tend to fray and break much less as you're sewing. If you use a very cheap thread, like I have some right here, like you might get at a Walmart or other mass retailer, although they also sometimes carry the fine threads. What this is, is it's not pure cotton. It's cotton on a polyester core. And if you use that, it will often fray as you're sewing and your thread will break all of the time. And that can be a giant nuisance as you're learning to sew. So some people tie a knot at the end of their, um, at the end of their thread. I'm a knot tire myself, but you can also anchor your um, stitches as you sew. So I'm going to show you how to do that. All right, we've got our thread, our threaded needle. We're ready to sew. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to fold down the fabric so that it is really tight with the template. You don't want any looseness. You don't want any air. In there you want this folded as tight as you can get it against the edge of your template. So next thing you're going to do is you're going to do a fold around that sharp sharp corner that we talked about and you're going to again tightly press with your fingers the fabric against the edge of the hexagon and what you should end up with is two sides tightly folded against the edge of the hexagon and this little pleat here that does not pop over the edge to the front. This tight little pleat here where you fold, made the fold in the fabric as you turn the corner around the template. Okay, so now it's folded tightly. This is the tricky part because you're going to have to hold this like this between your thumb Hang on just a second. Your thumb and your forefinger are going to have to hold this pleat down as tightly as you can. And then what you're going to do is you're going to come in with your needle and thread and you're going to sew through the layers of fabric. You are not going to sew through the cardboard. Be very careful not to catch the cardboard. You're just going to sew through the layers of fabric. You're going to pull through leaving a little bit of a thread at the end. You can see here I'm leaving a little bit of a thread at the end, maybe about, I want to say, two inches. Okay, so what I'm going to do now to anchor this is I'm going to take a couple of stitches here. I'm going to go through again, and as I go through, I'm going to catch the loop of the thread so that I'm making a knot. So let's do that one more time. I'm going to go through like this. And then I'm going to catch the loop. And again, we're using doubled thread, so you want to catch the loop through like that. And don't worry if you get a little bit tangled. You can just sort of tease out the thread using your fingers. The important thing is that this is secure now inside the hexi. So now that you've done that, what you want to do is you want to move on to the other corner. 
you're going to fold down this side again and you're going to turn the next corner and you're going to hold that corner very firmly but you're not going to now anchor this why because you're all the way over on the other side of that little side of the hexi you need to now get to that side of the hexi so what you're going to do is you're going to take a running stitch and this is obviously I'm going to have to hold this up to the camera it's not going to be as exacting as it would be in real life you're going to take a running stitch and you're just going to sew through the fabric again don't catch the cardboard catch only the fabric and you're going to just keep sewing till you get to the corner with a nice long running stitch then you get to the corner and what I like to do at this point is I can I've gotten to the point where I've been doing this for long enough I can just sew through the corner in a way that it solidifies it but if you want to take a single back stitch do so but you might end up wanting to leave it a little looser on your first practice pieces so that if you don't do as exacting a job as you would like you can unpick the stitches and again here we go again we just do a running stitch through the fabric only and we just keep going like this we keep going around the shape making a running stitch that again never catches the cardboard but always always catches the little corners that we're trying to keep sharp and we just keep sewing around in a running stitch and this goes pretty quickly with practice as you can see I'm already about halfway around and I haven't been sewing with huge precision so that you can see the side the stitches in real life you are not probably going to want to take such giant stitches but I want you to be able to see the giant stitches here and again it's a running stitch that you're performing and you're going to sew all the way around the hexi just like that so once you are done having sewn around all you're going to do is you're going to then anchor your stitches one last time so I'm going to in the interest of time show you how to anchor your stitches right here and what that means is you get to the last corner and you're going to take several tiny little back stitches and again just going to take several very very tiny little back stitches and pull through pull through here to make a knot and then do another couple of back stitches so now you've pulled through and you've made a knot so now what you should end up with is a fully pieced hexi it's going to look like this this is going to be um, the hexagon with the little piece of cardboard still inside and these are commercial templates that I purchased and what they have is a little hole so that you can use a pencil to pull them out your templates you could make a hole in them or you could just pick them out it's pretty straightforward and easy to pick them out so what we're going to do now is we're going to start sewing the hexes together in this case I am actually going to make a knot in my thread and this is controversial I do want to tell you a lot of quilt makers do not believe in um, making knots but I find it easier I can always just cut the knot out later so what am I going to do now to piece these two together I'm going to take two completed hexes as you see here I'm going to put them fabric sides together like this and then all I'm going to do is whip stitch the two of them together and then I'm going to take another one and whip stitch that as well so I can show you right now how do we whip stitch what we do is we just take a couple of teeny teeny threads on the side and we pull through and again we take a couple of teeny teeny threads very very teeny teeny threads just going through the top little folds of the fabric and pulling through we're going to go along this side and then when you're done it should be two pieces sewn together they were going to fit together like this then what you're going to do is you're going to take your next hexi piece you're going to fit it in between the two and then again you will fold 
these two pieces together you're going to sew in to the join where the third piece joins up with the corners of the first two pieces you'll sew this bit together then you will open up and sew the next two together in a Y seam and you will just keep going like this sewing the hexagons together typically people will make them into a shape where there's one hexagon in the middle and then all six sides have hexagons attached to them but you can do any shape you want I've made doilies where they're very free form and that can be a very pleasing shape as well you can sew them together at random or you can sew them to together to make tessellating shapes but they all work together to create a um, pleasing hexagon shape so now that you've completed your hexes once you've sewn the pieces together they're still going to be cardboard inside of them so what you're going to do again this has a hole in it you don't necessarily need to have a hole in it is I'm going to use in this case I'm using a knitting stitch holder because it's an easy thing to hold you can also use a small pencil um, you're just going to go in and you're going to pop out the cardboard and it's not as easy as it looks you need to be super delicate and what you're going to do is you're going to pop out the cardboard now when we look at the salt install quilt you can see here I'm just gently peeling out the cardboard and it'll just come out with care on its own this is why when you're sewing you want to be super careful not to catch the cardboard because if you catch the cardboard there you are you've uh, basically sewn through the cardboard and you are quite quite stuck um, it happens when you're learning all the time that you catch the cardboard so if it's a small catch just gently tug it free and you can you'll just have to discard that template if it's caught more um, you'll definitely have to re-sew it you'll have to pick the pieces out and re-sew it but typically that takes a little couple of goes to practice and you should be all set to go so again you can make these quilts uh, big small you make them out of every kind of fabric once you've made once you've practiced you can even just sew a few hexagons together and use them as an accent piece on a purse a tote bag or on clothing you can line them and make them into pockets on clothing as well they're a really versatile take-along project something you can sit on your porch and do um, you can do them anytime anywhere any place and they're a really fun way to use up scraps of fabric as well as making long lasting heirlooms and I hope you really enjoyed this demo again I dropped the link in to the um, chat where you can get these templates you can google for others if, if you need something that's free if ten dollars is tough right now again I don't make anything off of it this is the vendor I simply go with um, so you might be able to find some great free sources as well again all you really need again needle thread cardboard well cardstock and a um, amplitude of little scraps I also did neglect to mention you are going to need pins you're going to need these kinds of pins with a little head in order to pin your fabric together but again if you don't have pins you can always just use a spare sewing needle it'll just be a little tougher to pull out of the um, pinned fabric so optional to have pins but I highly recommend it if you want to make several hexes well we're at time so thank you for coming out to this demo it's been a delight to sew with you I hope that you enjoyed it and um, I would love to answer any questions if people want to stick around for um, questions. so will I show some of my work absolutely um, I will need to share photos as well because I don't happen to have them sitting next to me right now but um, I can show some of my work let me share it right now so in terms of patchwork quilting I've got a couple of examples that I you can show now most of these would work with um, English paper piecing templates typically people do nowadays um, use 
hexagons, but you can use a wide range of other shapes as well. So let me share with you a couple of examples of my work. So here are, let me just, with Facebook, it is tougher to share my screen. Okay, so let me just pop some links into the chat so that you can see. So here is a pattern of mine. I don't know how to share my screen right now seems to be lagging. So I'm going to just pop some links in. Ingrid, is there a way for me to share my screen? It's not really giving me that option. It, you know what, I will just pop in the links. So this one here, if you want to click through and take a look, this is called Cornflower Crossing. This is Made several years ago, it was published in um, yeah, it's Quick Quilting Magazine. It was a pattern that was available. You can still buy the pattern off of eBay. And this one was not made using English paper piecing. This was used um, strictly with just measuring and cutting the fabric. And you will find that it's a little bit more time consuming to make it that way. It did require the use of a sewing machine, but it was a great project to work on. Let me show you something else as well that I made some time ago. It's going to be um, a sun. Let me see. Oh, goodness. I... So here's another image of a quilt. doesn't want to come up. Oh, here we go. Sunny Days. And here's a link to it on Pinterest. And this was a, a simple quilt where it's a good example, if you want to take a look, of how you can create secondary patterns out of geometric shapes. You, we cre ended up creating a um, star pattern, geometric shapes. And that's, a, again, a pattern. I think it's handy to share these because you can also see the patterns as well. Let me also share with you a group quilt that I was a part of that involved signing each individual piece of the quilt. Um, oftentimes when you um, make a quilt together as a group, you leave one quilt square inside each larger block, which is what we call the, the, the big geometric shapes that you put together out of smaller geometric shapes. The patterns come together in what we call blocks, which are multiple different um, geometric shapes. You will leave one piece of that in a simple plain fabric, and then people can sign that in a marker that's suitable for fabric. You need to buy a special fa um, marker to do that. And um, you can, individual people who worked on the quilt can um, end up signing that. So I also have a very large quilt that was, here we go, a very large quilt that was exhibited at the last um, Festival of the Arts event. It's, it's this giant blue my quilt. You will forgive me for not lifting that up today because it is very, very difficult um, to to lift up. And so here's another quilt of mine that I published in Fan Tree Magazine, and this was a signature quilt. And a signature quilt is what I was just talking inside of each um, block being a simple piece of muslin fabric that has no pattern on it, and then you sign the center. And this was something that I wrote an article about how these were often used by entire families or entire graduating high school or college classes to commemorate a period in their lives. So if you have a graduating senior right now and obviously they can't have a commencement ceremony, this could be an option to make their day special is have everybody who is special in their own individual lives sign a block of a quilt. 
It could be yearbook style with an inscription. It could simply be their names. Both were very popular in the 19th century. And people would sign individual quilt blocks. It would be assembled into a quilt. And then the quilt was given to the graduating senior or the person getting married or moving away as a memento of the time in their lives that was coming to a close. If you take a look at my article in Family Tree Magazine with a quilt that I made together with a group of wonderful volunteers that I worked with at the New England Quilt Museum, you can um, see an example of that, but you can also do a similar quilt with hexes. People could even sew the individual blocks themselves. And that's a way that was traditionally used to acknowledge people's graduations that we could very well revive in this time in order to make people's graduations special even in this extraordinary time and it will be in a memento to them for the rest of their lives as many of these preserved quilts were. Um, do I recommend finger pressing as I go? In effect that is what you are doing when you are making the hexi. As you're sewing through the fabric layer you're finger pressing because remember you have to hold it down really really tightly in order to keep true to the shape. So you're finger pressing as you go by default. So yes I do recommend it but it's going to happen naturally as you piece. So take a look at those links that I have when we get to meet again in person. I can share a couple more quilts that are way too big to hold up. Um, but those are a couple of the examples, again, two that have secondary patterns that come together by thoughtfully assembling different colors and shapes. And one that is a signature quilt used to commemorate somebody um, having a transitional time in their lives, which I think is a nice thing that we can use today together to celebrate those of us who are graduating um, or, or not. And the original of this quilt, by the way, that I just showed you, um, was, is owned by a quilt maker named Lori Chase. And it was made in 1857 by a Quaker community in Ware, New Hampshire. And it was given to one of the members of the community at a transitional time in her own life when she had visited the community, stayed there for a significant amount of time. And when she was moving back, she was given this quilt in 1857. And so we reproduced it together um, as a way of replicating and um, signifying a special time together in our, um, in our lives as um, volunteers. And so I'm quoted in this article, I believe, um, or I played a role in, oh, I remember now, I was um, the person who connected the, per, the historian in this article. Yep, I'm also quoted in it. So take a look at that. Um, and that, again, is a reproduction quilt that we made together. Um, based on that pattern, I can still dig up that pattern as well. I'm not quite sure, looking at that photo, whether they use the, the reproduction in it. But looking for it, I can pull, pull it together and send it to anyone who's interested. It's a multi-page PDF that I happen to have filed away there, but you can use that, and that is though not an English paper piece pattern. Okay, so I'm looking at the comments. Again, it looks like we don't have any more comments. Well, thank you everybody for coming out for this um, demo. Again, if you're looking for any of the patterns that I showed there, both the reproduction and also my own original designs, just let me know. Um, one of those patterns, you can see, you can get it on eBay for $250, but I don't make anything off of that, so I'd be happy to send it to you for free. Um, just uh, let me know, and I will get those patterns pulled together and sent to you. Um, but I really enjoyed demoing this with you, and I hope that you enjoy making a quilt, whether it's to commemorate a special time in your life or the life of a family member, or just to have something fun to do that's creative and uses fabric in a way that's very environmentally sustainable. I've really enjoyed this time with you. So happy quilting, and um, please follow those links in the um, the the comments if you want to learn a little bit more. It's been wonderful connecting with all of you. Take care.